Falcon on quantum mechanics and spectral theory. And uh, before we start with the invited speakers who are going to talk today, I have a short uh, remark for uh, those people who are going to present uh, a contributed talk uh, tomorrow afternoon. So since we have uh, 10 contributed talks in two hours and a half, please uh, uh, take into account that uh, the contribution is 15 minutes, including questions. So uh, if you like to have questions, which is always uh, desirable, uh, please try to finish uh, in 13 or uh, 14 minutes. Okay, the speakers uh, of today will be introduced by Svetlana Gitomirskaya, who is uh, connected online. And uh, before uh, uh, doing that, let me show the souvenir of uh, ECMP 2021, which uh, will be shipped uh, to the speakers who are not on site. So please, uh, Svetlana. Hello, everyone, and uh, without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Alex Elgert from Virginia Tech. And uh, most of you have probably heard of the adiabatic theorem, but I at least am, will hear today for the first time about the locobatic theorem. Am I pronouncing it correctly, Alex? Yep. OK, please, Alex. Um, I want to thank uh, organizers for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity to talk. Uh, so uh, let me start my slides. Yeah. Okay, so it's a, a joint project with uh, Wojciech de Rock and Martin Fras, and I hope to, to explain. Uh, the name of this uh, result uh, at the end uh, of the talk. Um, so, uh, first, yeah. Uh, so, our motivation comes from linear response theory, so which is a standard setting. So, you consider a, a time independent operator H naught, and you start to drive it. <coughs> And the strength of this driving is beta, and corresponding time dependent operator is h of t that appears here. <clears throat> and for concreteness, let me think about this operator as acting on some finite blocks of uh, linear size L on a discrete uh, lattice, uh, or you can think about torus of the, of the same dimension. And uh, so, what is the problem for linear response? So you want to understand the solution of a Heisenberg equation. And I want to start with initial state rho, which is uh, something that can use with uh, operator H0. Uh, so uh, either a Fermi Dirac um, distribution or for purposes of this talk, I will just assume that uh, rho is uh, a spectral projection for operator H0. And then you can formally solve it uh, in order, uh, first order in beta. And you obtain that uh, the deviation of rho of t from rho is given by this expression plus corrections, which are of high order in weight. But interesting question is uh, why actually this uh, makes any sense? So, uh, so linear response theory is used uh, often in physics and, uh, for instance, uh, uh, in applications to quantum Hall effects. Uh, it, uh, it describes uh, green Kuba formulas there. Uh, but uh, but what is the problem? I mean, so we have these three parameters uh, for o object row, uh, the driving beta, uh, time t, and the system size L. So if you want to probe the response of the system, then uh, you need to take this limits in the right order. And the right order would be to take a thermodynamic limit, uh, uh, this script that L goes to infinity first. And then uh, if you want this response to be non-trivial, uh, you need the total variation of, uh, of your driving to be uh, uh, substantial. In particular, this uh, uh, product of T with beta should be actually large, or in, even better, uh, should converge to infinity as uh, we take uh, limits. So this is definitely not uh, what uh, this uh, simple derivation of linear uh, uh, response uh, uh, tell us to do. And uh, so the question is why it is uh, still applicable in this uh, very different region. 
Okay, so that was the motivation. Uh, I will actually consider a little bit more specialized this problem of, uh, so I will place things in the so-called adiabatic framework. And this adiabatic framework is the one where you assume that dependence of operator H of T on time is actually slow. And slow would mean uh, dependence of this uh, uh, driving W on uh, T will enter through this uh, scale. The scaling parameter epsilon. So there is this epsilon t dependence inside, and epsilon is small, so called adiabatic parameter. Now, so even so, that the slow, I will be interested in very long times. So typical times uh, of order one over epsilon or longer. <clears throat> so you scale your Heisenberg equation and you obtain this equation uh, for objects that I will call uh, as it should be a rho of epsilon in both sides. So uh, it's uh, so rho of epsilon is the Heisenberg uh, a solution of this initial value problem. Uh, and the depends on epsilon only enters through the left-hand side. And again, I start with some state rho, which is my initial uh, density uh, matrix. And as I said, we're interested in uh, the three limits. So in this case, it's L, epsilon, and beta. Uh, so L goes to infinity, epsilon, beta goes to zero in some specific order. Okay, so um, so the important part uh, or is, uh, of the game will be this uh, so-called folk adiabatic theorems, which is sort of a physical statement that tells us the following. Dynamical evolution follows the spectral one in the limit epsilon goes to zero. So uh, let me illustrate it on a trivial example first. So consider case one beta is equal to zero. So it's an autonomous case uh, system does not depend on uh, time at all. And so if you start with the uh, spectral projection for rho, uh, then uh, it remains spectral projection for all types. So this is obvious uh, fact. But you see that indeed in this case, dynamical evolution trivially follows the spectral one. And second uh, situation, which is a little bit more interesting, is the uh, so-called standard adiabatic theorem. And it holds for so-called gap Hamiltonian. So you start with operators uh, H of S, consider its uh, spectrum, and assumes that it has some this capital S uh, a portion of the spectrum, which is isolated from the rest of the spectrum of the instantaneous Hamiltonian H of S by a gap G, which is greater than zero. And uh, sorry. And uh, uh, that I want this condition to hold for all times S, so it's uniform uh, gap condition. And then I can associate with this, uh, uh, this uh, portion of the spectrum projection PS, which is just corresponding spectral projection of Hamiltonian H of S. And I will assume that my initial state is just this uh, projection at time zero. And then the Qualitative statement of adiabatic theorem is uh, the following that if you take uh, limit epsilon goes to zero, then uh, rho epsilon of s remains close to p of s or actually converges to p of s in norm as uh, uniformly in s. And in addition to gap condition, I need to assume that h is smooth, in fact, just twice differential. Okay, so uh, so principal example uh, that uh, would uh, serve us later in the talk as well is this just two-level system. So on the left, I consider a case when uh, eigenvalues cross. So the corresponding Hamiltonian is just a diagonal one, and uh, corresponding eigenvalues I will call e plus and e minus. Uh, and uh, the corresponding eigenvectors do not change with s; uh, they just uh, given by vectors e1 and e2, so the standard basis vector. So clearly, the level crossing means that there is no uniform gap. And the second example, I just modify this, uh, uh, this linear operator by uh, something that has off-diagonal entries, uh, G, and then the uh, uh, picture becomes the one that is described here with the smallest gap being 2G. So, so there is this E minus and E plus. And, uh, and is a, what I will call adiabatic pass is the when you change S, you sort of follow this, uh, yeah, this lower curve, and there will be diabatic S, which means that uh, you jump from one curve to another. So that, that I will call diabatic pass. <clears throat> so let me uh, mention that uh, avoided crossings is usually associated with the concept of uh, so-called hybridization, which will play a role later on. Uh, and this is just uh, means the following. So if you start with a system which is where, where a gap is large, or say take S to plus or minus infinity, then you see that corresponding eigenvectors 
they are fairly close to eigenvectors of this system. So they are E plus and B minus, essentially. But when you come to the crossing or avoided level crossing, then they start to mix up. So this, uh, so you see that you actually get some linear combination of E1 and E2 for uh, S equal to 0. So, so this uh, effect I will refer to as hybridization. So there is mixture between uh, sort of uh, two different states, at least in uh, as we consider references is uh, picture on the left. Okay, so so why is this uh, is any role? So uh, so importance of that comes uh, through the fact that. Uh, yeah, of course, this uh, formal statement of a diabetic holds in this situation. Uh, if we have a uh, uh, level gap, uh, so gap between levels, it holds. But the question is how small epsilon should be in order actually to see that this norm becomes small. So in other words, I'm asking a question under what uh, conditions on epsilon. Uh, if you start with initial state, which is, say, p plus of 0, under what conditions this uh, difference is uh, much more than 1. So uh, you think about this for a moment, you understand that uh, the only scale comes into this game from the gap. And so you can form dimensional parameter epsilon divided by g. So if epsilon divided by g is small, that indeed uh, a measure of smallness. And we have the adiabatic dynamics, so this object will be small. But if epsilon over g is actually large, uh, it's exactly opposite. So we will have diabatic dynamics. So we're going to transition to the second curve. Okay, so now let me formulate this uh, a little bit uh, more formally. Uh, so, so this is a, a standard uh, diabetic system for gap systems uh, and goes back uh, all the way to uh, Avron, uh, Zeller, and Jaffe. So, uh, so you consider a family of operators that are uh, twice differentiable. You assume gap conditions as before. And then you look at the solution of the uh, Heisenberg equation. And then you can find the constancy that does depend on, on the gap, so that, in fact, you can bound the difference between the physical evolution and instantaneous spectral data by something which is proportional to epsilon. OK, um, so constant actually is not 1 over g, but, uh, uh, but uh, if I assume something a little bit stronger about uh, dependence uh, smoothness of function uh, h, then I can actually make it 1 over g, but, uh, so, but it's not terribly important. OK, so let me just flash this, uh, uh, this, uh, this reference uh, to different results. I mean, uh, it's very long, uh, old result. Uh, so first results actually predate uh, quantum mechanics. And mostly what I'm going to talk about will be related to extensions uh, in uh, some recent years. Um, so what are extensions of this standard results that I've shown? Uh, so, as I already mentioned, it relies on H of S being smooth, but if you think about that, if your projection uh, uh, PS is a gap to projection, then it means that P of S is smooth. So, in fact, the uh, adiabatic theorem relies on P of S being smooth and this uh, portion of the spectrum being gapped. But you can extend it into uh, different situations. So, for instance, one situation where you, you get such extension is uh, uh, family P of S is uh, smooth, uh, in fact, fine trunk, but there is no gap. So, so this is a typical situation in uh, quantum electrodynamics, for example. And um, second situation uh, that might occur is that you do have a spectral gap, but projection P of S is not smooth. And um, such a situation happens when you take a thermodynamic limit of many body uh, system. And this is, was done uh, a few years, years ago by uh, uh, Bachmann, uh, De Rock, and Frass. And uh, they also noticed, uh, I mean, this is probably observation that goes back uh, uh, much older observations that actually uh, limits epsilon beta can be interchanged uh, if one is interested in local observables. So in particular, linear response theory is bad uh, in, in such a city. So in this work, I am going to actually let go to both uh, smoothness and gap condition. So, um, so I, the situation occurs when you consider adiabatic driving in a semiconductor. So how you sort of uh, model, model this uh, situation, you consider operator H of S that consists of two parts. So the H naught part is actually going to be a random part. So it's some kind of describes the disorder system. And then you still have some driving. 
And uh, I will assume that my disorder system has what is called mobility gap, uh, which is a region, a region uh, in, uh, in R of exponential localization. So spectrum of this operator H omega there is uh, assumed to be pure point uh, uh, and uh, uh, corresponding eigenfunctions are localized in the sense of equations that I displayed here. Okay, so a typical example would be Anderson localization. So you consider operators that consist of two standard parts, the translation invariant one and the multiplication operator by a random potential uh, with usual assumptions on random. So let me not dwell too much on that. So it's known to have a mobility gap uh, in uh, so-called perturbative regimes uh, uh, and in, uh, in dimension one everywhere for almost all configurations of formula. And the uh, point here is that the emission of zero measure set here is not for a lack of trying. So there is something interesting happening in this set. And in fact, uh, it's uh, directly related to the driving. So I uh, am going to um, dwell on that for a while. So, so what happens at this exceptional values of random potential? So consider, so here is the uh, complete question. So let's say you start with operator uh, H omega, but then you perturb it by just uh, rank one uh, projector uh, to the side zero, uh, and the strength of perturbation is big. But uh, so we know that this operator H beta is going to be localized for almost all values of beta for the same reasons as H omega is localized for almost all omegas. But what about the exceptional values of big? And you see, if you want to investigate to driving, uh, then you have to understand a little bit this behavior because uh, you, as you increase driving beta or S, if you wish, uh, you cannot escape this uh, uh, exceptional values. So, uh, so basic question here actually uh, turned out to be uh, to avoid level crossing or not to avoid level crossing. So, uh, so really quickly, uh, what I mean by that. So suppose you can find eigenvalue, let me call it lambda left of beta for this operator, uh, which is sensitive to beta. And uh, this typically happens if you can find eigenfunction that is supported near the uh, uh, perturbation, namely near the origin. So it turns out that you always can do that. And now consider another eigenvalue, uh, uh, let me call it lambda right, which at, z at time zero is close to lambda left, uh, uh, but its eigenfunction is supported far away from origin, which is possible because we have exponential localization, right? And then the question is, as I start to change beta, which picture would I see? Would I see this uh, blue lines, the crossing, or would I see this avoided crossing in red lines, right? And uh, as I mentioned, this, uh, there is a relation uh, between uh, concept of uh, level crossing and uh, avoided crossing and hybridization of eigenvalues. And that's actually uh, um, something that we uh, can show um, uh, in uh, one dimension. So, so, so the first result I want to present is the following. Um, so uh, let me form it in a sort of qualitative way. So, uh, so if you consider a standard Anderson model in one dimension, then under uh, uh, mild uh, assumptions on W and some regularity assumptions on random potential, the eigenfunction hybridization does occur on all scales with scale independent probability. So by that, I mean, take torus of arbitrary large size, you will find uh, uh, hybridization there and fraction of, uh, of uh, eigenvectors that hybridize actually uh, is, uh, is substantial. So it's not going to zero with the size of the torus. And the corresponding eigenvalues exhibit avoided level crossing. In fact, we can estimate uh, the size of uh, gaps. So uh, let me just comment that uh, destruction of uniform localization properties via a resonant hybridization uh, it was known uh, before. It uh, was investigated in length uh, by Eisenman and Bartzel in a number of papers. Uh, and it's also presented in a very nice book. Uh, but we are not aware for any, even for D equal to one. So that actually leads to the following uh, interesting question. So who actually wins in this game? So, uh, so on one hand, we have this, uh, we can consider spectral flow of eigenvectors as a function of S. 
And then the hybridization sort of tells you that this flow is very non-local because you, uh, if hybridization occurs between two eigenvectors that are sort of initially uh, localized in a different part of uh, your space, a hybridization will tell you that suddenly you find some part of your eigenfunction very far from the place you started, with, right? But on the and, and full Gaussian basic theorem tells us that dynamics should follow spectral data. So in other words, it, uh, it sort of uh, shows that you would think that physical evolution should be uh, uh, very non-local. But on physical level, you sort of ex expect that uh, physical evolution cannot be arbitrary and non-local, especially if you expect uh, uh, that you know that you would have some kind of localization. Uh, so the question is, who going to win, adiabatic theorem or, uh, or, or uh, localization? And it's so now that localization wins uh, uh, in this contest, uh, and uh, uh, at least in the uh, regime we consider. And uh, uh, accordingly, we call the result the locobatic theorem. And informally, this is just a statement that physical evolution follows a local spectral data, not the global. Spectral data. So there is adiabaticity, but it's local adiabaticity, not the global adiabaticity. So, uh, so let me, uh, in order to introduce my main list, let me just very uh, briefly flash this uh, uh, slide on assumptions. So it's a standard assumptions for um, uh, for uh, uh, localization business, uh, short range statistical independence and fractional moment condition. And uh, now, I, in order to uh, explain the result, I, I will make two definitions. So one of them is uh, a notion of uh, L dynamical and spectral localization. So uh, again, I, I switched from uh, Heisinger picture to Schrodinger picture. So I now consider this uh, evolution of the initial state. Uh, so this, uh, uh, and it will be just for convenience purposes, let me replace uh, Z by a torus of uh, arbitrary large size L. Uh, so I will explain why it comes, uh, why it's easier to, to present results in this way, and uh, uh, consider uh, evolutions, uh, physical evolution of initial state, which is given by uh, eigenstate of the system at time zero. So I will say that psi is uh, L uh, localized, or to be more precise, L uh, dynamically and spectrally localized. If the, you can find the constants and the region uh, R in, uh, on, on your torus T, whose diameter is, is controlled by this parameter L, that's uh, the same which is in this definition of L localization, so that uh, you, there exists some uh, spectral patch as not in the spectrum of operator H restricted to this uh, region R, for which the following two conditions hold. So first of all, I, I want the spectral patch to remain isolated from the rest of the spectrum of the corresponding operator HR. Well, you can guess that it's done so that the standard adiabatic theorem will work. And second uh, assumption is, uh, uh, is uh, 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 for this definition is that uh, the physical evolution of initial state stays close to uh, a range of uh, this local projection P. So local projection P, because it's associated with this operator HR, and uh, in particular, this projection is just supported in the region R, right? So, uh, so region of diameter L. So it's both uh, displays dynamical and spectral localization in the sense that P of S is localized in space, but it's also localized in uh, energy, as we will see, this uh, spectral patch S is actually quite thin. Okay, so second definition that I would need is uh, uh, the uh, definition of L good set. Uh, so, so consider any closed interval J prime that is contained in this uh, mobility J block. And I will say that a random configuration omega is L good. If a fraction of eigenvectors in this interval J prime that are um, uh, L localized uh, exceeds one minus something sub, uh, sub exponentially small in uh, size uh, L. And constants, of course, should be uh, omega independent. And then the uh, assertion is that uh, if you assume this uh, three conditions I mentioned before, a little bit more than that, but essentially those three conditions, uh, and suppose that you can find a scaling parameter L so that uh, epsilon beta satisfies this uh, 
constraints. So, uh, so uh, basically, so epsilon should lie in this corridor of values, and beta should be smaller than just something polynomial in L. Then, as epsilon beta goes to zero, uh, you can find a sort of minimal value L naught for such that for all L greater than L naught, probability that omega is L good is uh, is uh, sub exponentially close to uh, one uh, in this uh, scaling parameter L. So uh, so pretty much uh, all almost all uh, eigenfunctions. Uh, for uh, this operator in this uh, uh, mobility gap uh, will be uh, spectrally and dynamically localized. So, uh, so here you see why I sort of uh, introduced torus uh, because otherwise it uh, would be a little bit more trickier to talk what fraction of eigenvectors means in uh, ZD. But in fact, uh, this is uh, you can also do. So you can actually uh, define what fraction of eigenvectors is uh, for ZD as well. But I just didn't want to do it for. Uh, technical reasons. So let me just uh, finally uh, flash two uh, uh, results uh, that sort of follows uh, from this uh, assertion. So one of them is sort of qualitative result, uh, which holds for ZD, uh, and it is the following one. So consider a Fermi projection of our operator H0. And uh, then uh, uh, if our assumption holds, then strong limit of epsilon beta goes to zero uh, of uh, Physical evolution for initial state actually uh, is going to give you just Fermi projection times zero, almost surely, uh, provided that you maintain some relation, uh, namely epsilon is not cannot be too small, so it cannot be a super exponentially small in beta. And uh, let me not uh, dwell on uh, remarks here, but uh, let me on only finish with uh, uh, this uh, justification of linear response theory. Uh, so uh, again, I will not uh, have time to explain setting, but essentially uh, this uh, uh, result is tight enough to establish validity of uh, green Kuba formula for a two-dimensional system uh, that is used in quantum Hall effect up to corrections of, of this order, uh, uh, provided that we maintain some relation between epsilon and beta. So epsilon uh, cannot be too small and it cannot be too large, uh, but it's sort of uh, reasonable physically speaking. So, um, so thank you for your attention. Okay. And uh, questions? So, uh, let me ask you the first question. Alex, the most natural question is, of course, uh, so this condition that epsilon cannot be too small is a bit strange. Um, so I can explain that. So you see, proof is based on something. So you see, um, localization itself, it's not a, a, a sort of a stable under perturbation. So you, you perturb like a little bit and you're done. But it turns out that you can introduce concept which is um, sort of um, a local structure that is uh, stable. So you, you have to take into account this uh, hybridization phenomenon. So if you have two eigenvalues that are sort of uh, supported on uh, eigenfunctions that are supported far away from each other, uh, you, you, you're going to have hybridization, right? Mm -hmm. But now if you take um, sort of very thin spectral projection, you, the, the point is that, you, you know, if you have one eigenfunction here and one eigenfunction is here, but they both in the range of this spectral projection, then when you start to perturb the system, um, you can get something that is uh, sort of hybridized, but still supported on the same uh, on the same two, two things, right? So it means that you basically want to, so you take a big box of size, say, capital L, and then there is natural scale which comes from localization, which is log L, right? Mm -hmm. so, so basically, you, you, you take your huge torus and you find spots where your eigens, eigenvalues can be actually supported in the thin projection. So the di diameter of these spots are essentially going to be logarithmically small in size of the system, right? Mm -hmm. But it tells you basically that that roughly gives you scale, right? So you, you, uh, so you cannot uh, go, you, you know, you cannot uh, actually goes back to your result with uh, the, the Rio and Simon, right? So, uh, yeah, you know, you cannot throw away this factor XM, 
uh, this mass uh, in, in front of exponential acquisition. So that actually where this logarithm. So you, you cannot do it sort of uniformly uh, uh, on the size of the torus. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. I don't think we have time for further questions unless there is something quick. But let's thank Alex again. And our next speaker is Van Tsai Liu, right? And he will tell us about um, uh, irreducibility of Fermi varieties for discrete periodic for discrete periodic operators. And applications. So first I want to would like to thank the organizers for the invitation and I thank everyone for coming. So I'm going to talk about the irreducibility of the firm variety for discrete shading operators. If time permits, I'm going to talk about several applications. So let's start with the operators. So we have a discrete Laplacian on ZD, which is, de is defined Laplacian U at set N equals the sum of all the nearest labors. For example, when D equals, sorry. So when D equals two, the site, the Laplacian at site N equals all the, the sum of all the four labors. We also have our periodic potentials. We say our, poten our function V is gamma periodic where gamma equals Q1z or plus Q2z until Qdz. If for any little gamma, uncapped gamma, the Vn plus gamma equals Vn. So roughly speaking, V is gamma, is, is gamma periodic means that V has a um, period Qj on this direction. So we assume the greatest common factor among all the, of the periods equals one. So here is our operator. Our operator is the discrete periodic shading operator. We have a discrete Lap Laplacian and then periodic potential. So we are interested in two varieties arising from um, the sh discrete shading oper periodic shading operators. Let's go to the definitions. So let EJ be the standard basis in ZD. So the block variety, which is standard, so depends on potential V. Is all is all the pair pairs K lambda in dimension D plus one, where K is in dimension D, and the lambda is the complex number, such that here, this is our eigen equation with the flow kate block boundary condition. So here, which means that after co after Qj site, this eigen this eigen solution changes by our factor e two pi i k j. So this eigen equation, this is a boundary condition, has a non-trivial solution. Then. This is the definition of block variety. So the K is called the quasi momentum in physics. So this is our block variety. We are also interested in the Fermi variety. The Fermi variety is just the level set of the block variety. We fix in the complex number lambda, study the level set of K lambda in the block variety. So this level Fermi variety definitely depends on the potential V and the energy level you choose. So we are interested in this for both varieties as analytic sets. So let me remind you the definition of, of analytic sets. So our set of sub at A is called analytic. If for any X in A, there is a neighborhood U and a family of analytic functions such that A intersecting U equals the common zero loss of the family analytic functions. So rough, roughly speaking, analytic set, which means that locally speaking, 
they set is determined by the common zeros of a family of analytic functions. So we can say later both block variety and the Fermi varieties are analytic set. Actually, analytic sets, uh, uh, indeed, they are principal analytic sets. Principal means that they are determinant by one analytic function. So the you know, definition is a finite, you know, a family of analytic functions. Here, for the block variety and the Fermi varieties, they are just one analytic function. So we will discuss the P sub V later. And I also I only want to remind you now that this function P is periodic with respect to K variables. So let's go to the block, flow K, the block boundary condition. You say this equation is unchanged if I change Kj to Kj plus one. This is why this function is, an, is periodic. So we are in, we, are, we care about the irreducibility. So our analytic set is called irreducible. If it cannot be represented as the union of two long empty proper analytic sets. So since we are only going to study block and Fermi varieties, they are principal analytic sets. So irreducibility of principal analytic sets, it's equivalent to that it can not be factorized into two analytic functions. Here, non-trivial means that the analytic function has a long empty zero set. So the main, two main problems in the area are two conjectures. The first conjecture says that, states that the block variety is irreducible. We need to merge the periodicity. As I mentioned, you know, they have the natural periodicity there, kj to kj plus one. The second conjecture states that the Fermi variety, we also need to merge the periodicity, is irreducible, except for finitely many lambda. So maybe there is, for some lambda, it's, there, is some special, there are some special situations. So it's easy to, it's obviously, it's obvious that the conjecture two implies conjecture one, conjecture one. So both conjectures have been mentioned um, in many articles since the 1990s, 1990s. So here is the some, sorry, here is some list. So the main result in this talk is that we are going, we proved both conjectures more precisely. When D is bigger or equal than three, we prove that the firm variety variety is irreducible for every lambda. So which is stronger than the conjecture. The conjecture you know, is possibly accepted for finitely many lambda. Here is every lambda. So we denote the bracket V, the average of the potential. We prove that when dimension D equals two, the firm variety variety is irreducible for every lambda except for one point. The one point is the average level. When this, if at the average level is, reduce, is reducible, then it has exactly two irreducible components. So theorem five and six immediately implies that the block variety is irreducible. You may wonder, what, you know, is this special point necessary or not? So when D equals two, here is the remark. For constant potential, this Fermi variety at the average level has exactly two irreducible components. So which demonstrates that our results are sharp. So after introducing our main results, let me briefly introduce the previous results. So previous results, mostly focus on the study of dimension two and three. So for example, for dimension two, the block variety is irreducible. For dimension two, this is irreducible, except for finitely many values of lambda. So we prove that for, except for one lambda. So there are other results, and also continuous version 
continuous version with Shimano that Laplace Shim plus V V is the continuous Laplace Laplace Shim. And I wanted to mention that all approaches are quite different from previous approaches. Previous approach approaches focus on construction of the compactifications of Fermi and the block varieties. Our approach focus, focuses on the study of the analytic function, P sub V, I just mentioned. So now let's go to the proof of the main result. So let me tell you more about this analytic function, which determines the block and the Fermi varieties. So let me introduce a new variable, zj equals u2 by ikj, and also introduce the fundamental domain of, of gamma, just you know, each side, nj in between zero and qj minus one. So the cardinality of omega is the multiplications of the periods. So we recall that this is our eigen equation. This is our flow the block boundary condition. Now we use the new variable zj. So we can write down the equation one and the two into a q by q matrix. This is the first you know, formulation. So let me briefly give you some you know, descriptions. So now, for example, we care about the dimension two. We study the dimension two problem. So d equals two. So here is q1, here is q2. This is the fundamental domain. So we can, if this operator, Laplace plus v, if they, if they choose set n, then Laplace u is the, all the four labels. It's still in the fundamental domain. You choose a point in the fundamental domain, after your action is still in this fundamental domain. However, if this guy is in the boundary, Laplace is the four, oh, so, sorry, here, is the four labels. Then this guy get outside the fundamental domain. Luckily, we have this floated block boundary condition. This point translated to this point. If we add, you know, Z1, we have Z1 in this matrix. So this is the reason why, finally, we can write down this equation one and two into a wagon value problem for a Q by Q matrix. The, the matrix depends on Z and the potential of A. Actually, it only depends on ZJ and the ZG inverse, right? Because if you here is Z1, and this, if you hit this boundary, this boundary, you have Z1 inverse. So we define this determinant of this matrix is dvz minus lambda i. Then this is curve the p. And if we go back to the original variable, just u2 pi i k1, u2 pi i k2, u2 pi i kd, we get this analytic function we use to determine our block and the Fermi variety. You can say in the following, I didn't make a difference. If I use curve the p, we use the variable z. If I use regular p, it's just that we use the variables k. So for dimension two, uh, for dimension one, for example, it's just as here is z, you have another variable, one over z. So you say, then our, our Fermi variety and the block varieties, after changing variables, actually they are algebraic sets, because this is a, lot, is a polynomial. So we can say more about this curved v, curved p. Curved p is a polynomial in variables z1, zj, zj inverse. As I mentioned, you know, you have zj, zj inverse. And the lambda with the highest degree here, and the lambda to q, because this is a q by q matrix, definitely is lambda to q's power. In other words, this curved P is a Lorentz polynomial of lambda. Actually, it's a polynomial of lambda, just the Lorentz polynomials of variables Z. Then we can reformulate our previous results. So let me give you the definition of the irreducibility of a Lorentz polynomial. We say a Lorentz polynomial is irreducible 
if it cannot be factorized non-trivially, that means that there are no non-monomial non polynomials f and g such that h equals f and g. Because non polynomial, you always allow a difference over monomial. Then, uh, in, in the paper, we actually prove there's the following two theorems. First, we prove that when d is bigger or, or equal than 3, for every lambda, the non polynomial as a function of z is irreducible. Then it implies the Fermi variety is irreducible. We start when dimension is equals is two, we prove that the Lorentz polynomial is irreducible, except for one lambda, the average lambda. When this Lorentz polynomial is reducible at the average, it has exact two factors. So, in our paper, we focus on the study of the Lorentz polynomial directly. So after all the preparations, I'm able to give you the ideas of the proof. So the proofs contain several steps. So the first step, so assuming we can factorize this polynomial, sometimes I just mentioned polynomial, indeed they are one of the polynomial. So into irreducible factors, fj, so we let in, we let z1, z2, zd minus one, the first d minus one variables go to zero in a proper way. So here, proper way, I mean that they go to zero in, you know, on some special curve we choose. So and solving this equation, this equation is the, this polynomial is essentially determinant you know, essentially determines this, uh, you know, block variety and the Fermi variety. We can say that either ZD goes to go to zero or ZD go to infinity. So what does this mean? Which means that every component, every factor, either meets Z1, Z2, ZD minus one go to zero, ZD go to Z, ZD equals zero, or Z1 equals zero until ZD equals zero and zd equals infinity. Here is always zero, either zero or infinity. Because when you solve this equation, we have zd go to zero or zd goes to infinity. So that's your first step. The second step is very technical. We needed to define our symptotics of this polynomial at zero, 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 or zero, zero, infinity. So I will tell you a little bit more about what's the definition of asymptotics. So luckily, the asymptotics is independent of the potentials. It's very reasonable, right? Usually, the asymptotics doesn't depend on the potential. So can be calculated explicitly by fluid transform. So both and asymptotics are irreducible. Both Asymptotics at this point and this point are irreducible. So then we can prove that this polynomial has at the most two irreducible factors. So here is the reason. So first you prove that every factor either pass this point from here or, or this point. Now you can calculate the asymptotics at this two point explicitly and show that they are irreducible. Then which matter it has at the most two factors. So now let me tell you what's the definition of the asymptotics. So let's pick this point first. The asymptotics is just the lowest degree component of this guy, but we change the variable. So you may wonder why we needed to change the variable. You know, I cannot explain you too much here, but I can tell you one insight here. So we're changing the variable zj to zjd. Recall that why we change the variables. Recall that the highest degree of PV is z1 q is zj co divided by qj, capital Q divided by qj. If we change the variables, they have the same highest degree, which 
benefits our arguments a lot. And also, in order to study the asymptotics at this point, we need to change the variable ZD to ZD inverse. Then we make it invalidity to zero. So now we prove that we have at most two irreducible components, as I mentioned earlier. So assume this guy has two factors, F1 and F2. In order to prove our two statements, I only need to prove that the only case this guy has two factors is that D, I mentioned D equals two and the lambda equals average, right? This is the only special situation in our statement. So now, this is a proof. We need to use degree arguments. So assume you have two factors. One factor is from zero, zero, zero. Another factor is from zero, 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 infinity. So since this, the asymptotics, as I mentioned, they can be calculated explicitly. So which means that fjz essentially equals asymptotics plus higher degree terms. Then we can use the degree arguments here to show that this is the only case. So here are, there are several opportunities, several difficulties. First, when we, as I mentioned, when we define the Lorentz polynomial, we allow, or even we factorize a Lorentz polynomial, we allow a difference of monomials, which makes the situation very difficult. You know, if you have monomials, you have the you they change the degrees. Secondly, I we needed to change the when we study asymptotics of this guy. We need to change the variable to, from ZD to ZD inverse. You need to change ZD to ZD inverse, which means that you change the degrees in some sense. So in our, actually in our proof, we need to choose, introduce another polynomial, P1, which you multiply a proper poly, monomial and make this not a polynomial, polynomial. So constantly playing between the polynomial P1 and the curve the P is another you know, challenging ingredient in our paper. As I mentioned, in order, this is because we wanted to use degree arguments, so this is very important. Only if you use a polynomial, you have this degree arguments. So basically, this is the ideas of the proof. So since I have several minutes left, I'm going to talk about uh, several applications. So actually, this is our original motivation to study irreducibility. So based on the irreducibilities, we can solve a lot of practical problems in mathematical physics. So let me remind you, let me mention something, one point. So in the previous arguments, all the potential way can be complex valued. So in the applications, you know, all the potential way, you know, all the periodic potential function is a real and is a real periodic function. So which means the operator is self-adjoint. So let me intro, let me tell you the first application. Assume you have a perturbated periodic operators. You have discrete Laplacian plus the periodic potential. Now we have a small perturbation. When there is no perturbation, we know that this, this operator has a purely absolutely continuous spectrum, no point spectrum, no singular continuous spectrum. So we are able to prove that under small perturbation, if the perturbation is decays super exponentially, gamma is bigger than one, then this operator doesn't have, doesn't have embedded eigenvalues. You didn't create extra eigenvalues in the spectrum band. So the proof is based on complex analysis of several variables and the unique, the unique continuation results of discrete Laplacian. So here actually is from the, you can see that here is from the unique continuation result. And definitely, you know, we also need to use the irreducibility results we just proved. So the first application. The second application, we can study the inverse problems. So we say we introduce a new concept, Fermi isospectrum. We say two periodic functions are Fermi isospectrum if their Fermi varieties are the same at one energy level. Then we are able to establish several rigidity statements. 
So assume V and Y are from the ISO spectrum. Then we can prove that if Y is separable, then V is separable. If V separable, which means this function can be separated into different, you know, function, you know, you, you know, in the all dimensions. So if we also prove that if V and Y, they are separable functions and they are from the ISO spectrum, then we are going, then we are able to prove that the lower dimensional decompositions VJ and YJ are flocked ISO spectrum. Here, flocked ISO spectrum means that is equivalent to that. There's two functions, there's two potentials have the same Fermi varieties for every energy lambda. In other words, these two potentials have the same block varieties, the lower dimension. The second applications. And we, actually, we have another application. We can study the extrema of this or over spectrum band function. Let the lambda star be an extrema over spectrum band function. And we prove that the level set of the extrema is a subset of the singular points of the Fermi varieties. Since we prove the irreducibility, and combining with the Bersut theory, we are able to prove that for dimension two, the level set of the extrema is finite, and which is bounded with explicit bounds. Let's solve another problem. It's colorly 15. So I'm sorry I didn't have time to you know, tell you more details about these uh, uh, applications. And uh, there are a lot of references related to the applications. Here is a list. Or a list. Here is a list. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Wensai. This is too many powerful and beautiful results. Questions? Quick questions. So there are quick questions in the lecture room. So John Michele, please. So you mentioned the results by Knörer and Trubowitz. Were they also for the lattice or were they not rather for the continuum? So which result? Knörer Trubowitz on irre partial result on your irreducibility of block varieties. Oh, yeah, mm, let me go to the previous. Uh, no, um, yes, here, yes, slide. Is this for the continuum, for continuum models or for lattice models? Here is for lattice model, here is for lattice model, and here is also lattice model. This is yes. for continuous. Ah, okay. So this is for continuous. The last two ah. is for continuous case. Ah, yes. The first three are for discrete case. Okay, I see you had it there. If I may, another question. Uh, what about inclusion of magnetic fields? It seemed to me that the symmetry Z goes to Z inverse play the role which you have in the in absence of magnetic field. And, and so uh, maybe the extension is not trivial. And did you think about it? Oh, yeah. Uh, so for this question, the answer is that I haven't a single I haven't thought about this uh, magnetic, this problem, yeah. <coughs> but but I, in our proof, I already use this kind of a symmetric structure, ZD to ZD inverse. I would like to ask whether you could also you, uh, treat other uh, kinetic energy operators than on the lattice than the lattice Laplacian, uh, say with the next nearest neighbor bonds mm -hmm. or so. Uh, it's a great question. Actually, we, we, just uh, last month we posted another paper on archive, which we are able to prove the, the other, you know, not just the discrete shading operator. No, you know, there are more general like the triangular lattice. A lot of other lattices we are able to prove the irreducibility of the block variety, but we didn't know how to prove the Fermi variety. This is a problem we are working on. Thanks. Any questions in the lecture room? So please. 
Uh, thank you for the nice talk. Um, okay. I was just wondering if uh, these results could be extended to time periodic potentials as well. Mm, time period. You mean which variable depends on the time? Oh, the like, potential? Uh, if the potential were made to become like a time periodic potential instead of a spatially periodic one. So, but if you study fixed energy T, so it's, it works because, you know, it works for any periodic potential. It's, so, but in your right. question, you mean that the Hamiltonian is time periodic and that every time mm. is also gamma periodic in space? Something yes. like that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, if you fix the time, so then it's a periodic, gamma periodic potential, then it's uh, irreducible. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, if this is not the case, then we thank uh, our speaker again. Okay, okay. and our last speaker today is Leona Parnowski uh, from University College London. And he'll tell us about uh, Bess's Omerfeld uh, property of multidimensional Schrodinger operators, periodic and almost periodic. Thank you very much. Uh, many thanks to the organizers. I was actually planning to come in person, be in Geneva, but unfortunately, at the last moment, it turned out that one of my two AstraZeneca jobs was produced in India and Europe apparently has not approved Indian AstraZeneca, and some British people were turned back from trying to, when they tried to enter Europe with this Indian AstraZeneca job, so I decided that I would rather uh, stay in London. Um, and my talk is about uh, better sum effect property, and I will uh, start by looking at periodic potentials, so this picture signifies periodic uh, business, and this is almost periodic. Right, so I will study uh, Schrodinger operator. My operators are going to be continuum, continuous, right? So minus delta plus potential. Uh, where potential is either periodic or almost periodic. So it's just sum of exponentials. Exponentials with some coefficients. So coefficients are chosen so that potential is real valued. And uh, sum is uh, over all thetas. Uh, running through some set theta capital. So these thetas are called frequencies, and theta capital is, of course, a finite or at most countable set. And my uh, main assumption is dimension is at least two. So uh, one-dimensional effects are completely different, so I will study multi-dimensional situation. Right, and uh, in the beginning, we assume that potential is periodic. Right, so that means that my uh, set theta capital, set of frequencies, is a lattice gamma, right? Gamma of rank D. Right, then, of course, we can use Flaquet block decomposition, and uh, first of all, we know that spectrum cannot have any singular continuous component, and if B is minimally regular, then we also can exclude uh, point spectrum, so spectrum is pure, purely absolutely continuous. And uh, my potentials, all my potentials are going to be smooth anyway, so let's assume that potentials are smooth. Right, and then uh, there is the celebrated Better Sommerfeld conjecture. Um, so um, this is Hans Better, this is Arnold um, Sommerfeld. And uh, they stated. Uh, the conjecture at least states that the number of gaps of periodic Schrodinger operator is finite if dimension is at least two. Um, now, they did not really formulate it, the conjecture as such. So they um, wrote a book on conductivity of metals, and they just observed that it looks, I mean, they made also some physical experiments, they observed that it looks that number of gaps is uh, finite. Uh, and the conjecture as such was formulated apparently by uh, Michael Shubin in the 50s, and he called it Better Sommerfeld conjecture. 
And conjecture stated that uh, number of gaps is finite. If dimension is at least true. Now, um, since I am going later to talk about almost periodic potentials and dimensions higher than two and three, so obviously better and Sommer had studied only dimensions two and three. So I think instead of formulating it as uh, calling it a conjecture, I would rather prefer to say that operator satisfies better Sommerfeld property. And also I will change the uh, definition slightly. I will not count the number of gaps, I will just state that uh, property is satisfied if spectrum of operator contains uh, all large energies, all sufficiently large energies, right? So if spectrum contains a semi-axis, then I say that operator satisfies better Sommerfeld property. And uh, in the periodic uh, case, this property was studied by many people. So the first results were obtained in the late 70s of last century. Uh, and then there were many results. Um, I will not tell you the detailed account who proved what. So there were a couple of uh, actually um, 20 or 30 years. So. Um, the uh, conjecture was settled more or less uh, more than 10 years ago, and we have managed to prove that better Sommerfeld property calls for arbitrary periodic operator. Uh, so potential is periodic, any dimension two or higher, and any lattice of, lattices of periods. Right, we have to assume that potential is smooth. For non-smooth potentials, this uh, property is still a uh, somewhat uh, open problem. Right, and uh, just maybe I will mention that uh, the next result is probably the state of the art at the moment, so we can also prove established better Sommerfeld properties for uh, any perturbation of uh, Laplacian or power of Laplacian of order smaller than the order of principal term. So in particular, magnetic Schrodinger operators, operators with magnetic potential, that is also periodic, uh, they also possess better Sommerfeld property. And um, I want to make a couple of remarks, emphasize a couple of important points uh, that we have observed while trying to prove this, uh, to establish this property. So first of all, if we increase dimension, it becomes more and more difficult to prove to establish this property, right? So for two-dimensional operators, there is uh, a proof that takes three pages by Dalberg and Trubovitz. But if we increase dimension, then for arbitrary uh, dimension, the proof is um, 50 pages or even more. Second uh, remark is that sometimes, in some situations, we can establish this property using number theoretical uh, methods, right? So prove things about distribution of lattice points in, uh, in balls, right? And we can use these methods when dimension is two, three, and four, or for special classes of lattices, for so-called rational lattices, right? However, if we increase dimension, if dimension is five or higher, and lattice is irrational, we need purely analytical methods, right? So more analytical and not a lot of number theory for high dimensions. Right, so these are two observations. And now uh, I want to move to a situation when V is not periodic, right? So um, in this case, we no longer have a Flaquet block decomposition. So we do not know what is the nature of the spectrum? Is it uh, it's no longer has to be purely absolutely continuous? So in, in principle, it could have singular continuous component. Okay, it cannot have um, isolated eigenvalues of finite multiplicity, but it could have some pure point spectrum, right? Uh, and uh, even proven in high dimensions, that spectrum uh, contains some, even some absolutely continuous part is a uh, very non-trivial problem. Right, also as I uh, emphasized above, so when we say better Sommerfeld property holds, it means all high energies are in the spectrum. 
We do not say anything about number of gaps, so in principle it could have that all high energies belong to the spectrum, but uh, at the bottom of the spectrum we have spectrum that is counterset, right? So number of gaps still could be infinite. Now, uh, if potential is not periodic, but still almost periodic, there are, roughly speaking, two reasons why it is not periodic. So one reason is that it could contain some frequencies that are not commensurate. Or second is all frequencies are commensurate, but they become smaller and smaller. So second case is called the limit periodic potential. And uh, so limit periodic potentials are potentials uh, that are of this type, so still uh, sum of exponentials over some set of frequencies. And set of frequencies is not just one lattice. But we take one lattice, we take lattice, same lattice of half the size, of quarter the size, of one eighth the size, and so on, and put all these lattices together. So in this case, uh, Yulia Karpesha, and her PhD student, Lee, they proved, uh, established better Sommerfeld property um, in two-dimensional situation. So uh, under some additional assumptions, so they were assuming that the uh, Fourier coefficients a theta decay sufficiently fast, um, super exponentially, uh, they established that they, uh, the beta Sommerfeld property holds, so they proved that all high energies are in the spectrum. And they also proved that spectrum has absolutely continuous component for, last, uh, for, for large energies. Right, so uh, they could not prove that spectrum is purely absolutely continuous for large energies, but they proved that in some sense most of the spectrum for large energies is absolutely continuous. Right, so this is what concerns limit periodic potentials. Now, um, so the next step is what we call quasi-periodic potentials. So it means that we cannot have uh, small frequencies approaching zero. So my set of frequencies is a finite set, but we could have some frequencies that are not commensurate, right? So there are no restrictions on set of frequencies other than uh, that theta is, is a finite set. Then Julia Karpershen and Roma Sternberg proved um, also some time ago the result um, established better Sommerfeld property uh, under two assumptions. So first of all, dimension is two. So again, very important assumption. And secondly, they assume that their set of frequencies is a subset of union of two lattices. So Z squared and alpha times Z squared, where alpha is a diaphantine number. Right? Um, so in other words, what they were assuming was that each frequency is a linear combination with integer coefficients of four what we call basic frequencies. So four basic frequencies are frequencies vectors with coordinates 1, 0, 0, 1, alpha 0, and 0, alpha. Right, so this was the assumption that uh, dimension is true and all frequencies are linear combinations of these for basic frequencies. Now, their proof was working for other basic frequencies, not necessarily these ones. So you could choose uh, for other basic frequencies, satisfying some properties, but um, the number four was also important. So their proof could not have been extended to uh, more than four basic frequencies. Right, um, now, how do these proofs compare with a uh, remark that I made about proofs in periodic situation? So I told you that in periodic situation, two-dimensional proof is relatively simple. Now, this property is absolutely not true in for almost periodic situation. So for example, this proof is something like 100 pa 150 pages long. So proof becomes much more difficult. Right, however, it turns out that for small dimensions, 
we can prove the conjecture using number theoretical properties. However, for almost periodic setting, small dimension means dimension two. So in both these results, so um, the authors were using properties about distribution of lattice points. However, this time we are talking not about usual lattice points for periodic lattices gamma, so lattices of rank D. So this time we talk about lattices of rank higher than D. So what are these lattices? We just take uh, L vectors, omega 1, omega L, where L is bigger than D, right, bigger than dimension, so number of vectors is bigger than dimension, right, we call these vectors basic frequencies, and then we make various linear combinations of these vectors with integer coefficients, right? So I take n to be a vector with integer coefficients, so all my entries are integer, and then I make a uh, formal um, dot product n times omega, so just linear combinations of omega with integer coefficients. So those are vectors in Rd, right? So of course this is no longer a discrete set, as we had in case of periodic lattices, and generically it is everywhere dense set. Uh, but uh, we still can study the distribution of these lattice points for, I mean, say, let's say that n has norm not bigger than million, and what can we say about distribution where these lattice points are located? Right, and we can prove various results of distribution of these lattice points, and these results are good enough to establish better Zomerfeld property in dimension two, but unfortunately they are not good enough to increase the dimension. Right, so therefore we have to do something else in high dimensions. And the main tool that we can use in high dimension is something that is called Burgain's Lemma. So Burgain's Lemma is a very technical statement. It takes at least a page to formulate it. I will not uh, not do it here. Uh, and practically speaking, Bourguin's lemma says that if you have a set in Rd that has very small volume, and this set is also uh, semi-algebraic, and you can estimate the order of the set, then you can say that lattice points, these are almost periodic lattice points, do not belong to the set very often. So most of huge amount, I mean huge proportion, so most of uh, these uh, quasi-periodic lattice points are not inside a set of uh, small volume. Uh, however, we have to pay some price for using Bourguin's lemma. Uh, and it means we, we, we cannot, is, uh, the Bourguin's lemma doesn't work for all sets of basic frequencies. It only works for generic sets of basic frequencies. So there are some sets of basic frequencies that we have to throw away. Right, so Bourguin's lemma, okay, there are also some other restrictions where we can use Bourguin's lemma, but the advantage of Bourguin's lemma is that this is the only show in town. So if you want to prove something about um, almost periodic operators in dimension higher than two, so three or higher, you really more or less have, you, you are bound to use Bourguin's lemma in uh, some shape or form. Right, so Bourguin's lemma was formulated not in the setting of continuous Schrodinger operators. Uh, it was formulated for discrete Schrodinger operators. And also it was formulated uh, in order to prove Anderson localization for discrete Schrodinger operators. So there was large activity, huge activity of proving Anderson localization for discrete uh, operators, discrete Schrodinger operators for any all dimensions. I will not really mention these results about Anderson localization. However, um, there is one result that I will mention now that is in some sense an analog of beta Sommerfeld property for continuous operators. So first of all, I will notice that for discrete Schrodinger operators, I mean, if potential is bounded, Laplacian is bounded, so those are bounded operators, so there is no high energy regime for such operators. Right, so uh, instead of high energy regime, people often use the regime of large or small coupling constant. Right, and then the result is like this. So consider uh, our operator HD. Uh, so D stands for discrete. 
Um, so it acts in L2 of Z, right? So just a uh, one-dimensional operator. So N is variable in Z. And uh, it is uh, has this form. So because lambda is my spectral parameter, I mean it's traditional for discrete uh, business to call spectral uh, to, to call coupling constant by lambda. My lambda is spectral parameter, so I am calling uh, coupling constant by t. And I want to study the behavior of spectrum of this operator for large t. Right here, so V is a, a function on a torus, real analytic function of the torus, and we just take values of this function at points x plus and omega, uh, where omega is diophantine, uh, diophantine vector. Right, um, so this is, um, this operator, when t is going to infinity, is in, in, in some sense, uh, would be considered as an analog of high energy regime in continuous case, right? In my personal opinion, probably the more, um, uh, a much better analog of high energy regime would be if we consider this operator and divide by T, the frequency. Now this would be much better uh, approximation of high energy regime. But of course this operator would be sort of would look a little bit too artificial, right? However, this operator with, um, with large T is more or less standard, uh, standard um, example for discrete in discrete settings. Uh, now, you could say that this operator is considered in one dimensional situation, right? And I have promised you that uh, our dimension is, is actually going to be too high. Now, it turns out that for discrete Schrodinger operators, in some sense, these operators have two dimensions. So one dimension is dimension where the operator is acting, and another dimension is, okay, the dimension where Aubrey-Dual is actually acting, so dimension where potential is actually living, right? And for for example, in this situation, for small values of t, morally, the dimension of this operator is actually dimension here one. But for large coupling constant, for large t, morally, the dimension of this operator is the dimension of the space where my potential lives. And so dimension is actually uh, two or higher, right? So, um, and for these operators, uh, there is uh, the following result. So first of all, maybe I would say that again, so better somerfield property tells that all energies, except energies that are at the bottom of the spectrum, are in, in, my, uh, in the spectrum of my operators. Right, so morally probably the analog in this great setting is all energies that are not very far through spectral edges are in uh, the spectrum. So something like spectrum contains an interval. But there is this result by Goldstein, Schlag, and Water that uh, states that these operators actually, uh, the spectrum for large T, generically spectrum is an interval, not just contains an interval, but is an interval. Right, and so as I said, uh, price we have to pay for using Brookings lemma, we, can, so, so, okay, so the story goes that Julia Karpeshin and Roma Sterenberg uh, came to, uh, together with me, we were, three of us were in 2015 in Cambridge at the program uh, devoted to periodic, almost periodic and random operators, and we started working on this problem. And, um, okay, five years later, we actually have proved the result. So we have proved that, um, operators in high dimensions, uh, dimension, so any dimension bigger than one, any number of frequencies, uh, satisfy better Sommerfeld property, and moreover, all high energies are not just in spectrum, but they are in absolute continuous part of the spectrum, right? So as I said, price to pay, we have to uh, exclude some frequencies. We have to exclude some frequencies which we declare to be bad. 
and the frequency that we exclude uh, depend on Fourier coefficients. So the result says you can give me any set of Fourier coefficients Vn. So uh, my sum here uh, here is finite, right? So uh, I am talking about quasi-periodic potentials. So you can give me any set of potentials, uh, set of Fourier coefficients Vn. I can throw away some set of frequencies, and this set has measure zero, such that for the rest of frequencies, better Sommerfeld property holds. So spectrum contains all high energies, and moreover, absolutely continuous spectrum contains all high energies. And I think this is a good time for me to stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Quick questions. Uh, okay, first uh, Pavel and then. Leona, you mentioned the situation when uh, this, uh, all the high enough energies are in the spectrum, but still the number of the gaps is infinite. Is, is there a, an example of a potential when this really happens? Uh, yes, there is an example. However, the potential is not, strictly speaking, almost periodic. I think, uh, okay, so the example is uh, constructed by David Damanik and uh, with, with some collaborators. I don't remember who were his collaborators. Um, and it's, so the potential is not, strictly speaking, almost periodic. It is some, I, I think they, they constructed it using a class of potentials that are called Fibonacci potentials. But it's, okay, morally, it's almost, almost periodic. Let's, mm. Let me put it like this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there it, was another question. Uh. Mm, okay, yeah. There was another question there, please. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I was wondering uh, what is smooth in your first theorem about periodic potentials? And my second Sorry, question, what is, what is smooth in your smooth. first theorem? Okay. Yes. Um, so uh, smooth means theoretically infinity. In reality, it means if dimension two, uh, we just need C0, we just need continuity is enough. In dimension three, something like C1 or C2 is enough. In arbitrary dimension, roughly speaking, C, let's say, 1,000 d cube is enough. But, I mean, 1,000 d cube is, is, is as good as infinity in my book, so... Uh, but you. there is some, some finite smoothness that, that would do the trick. I have a second question, please. Uh, I understand there are some uh, potentials so that the, the spectrum of the Hamiltonian contains uh, lambda plus infinity, but still has infinite, infinitely many gaps. But does uh, the fact that uh, Hamiltonian has the um, basis Sommerfeld property say something about the number of gaps? Um, no, not, I, uh, not necessarily. I, I, I think a priori it could be, it, yeah, so, so it could be one, it could be 17, it could be infinitely many, so, but as Omerfield property, just property of what happens for high energies. And uh, yeah, in principle, for, for small energies, it could be anything, anything you want. Thank you. Other questions? Um, so in your last theorem that is now on the screen, uh, can you say anything about the purity of this AC spectrum? Uh, whether it's pure or absolutely continuous, you mean? Yeah. Um, we conjecture the answer is probably yes, uh, and we could do this maybe for the price of throwing away some other set of frequencies of measure zero, but that's very difficult. To, I, I mean, uh, okay, it's, it's, it's probably a conjecture that spectrum for high energy should be purely absolutely continuously, generically. But, I mean, proving it requires... I mean, okay, this paper is 100 pages, and I, I, I guess you probably get at least another 100 pages to, uh, to, to get purity, and uh, at least one, one new idea, because, um, yeah, at the moment, we, we, we cannot prove it using... I mean, what we probably can uh, prove using our methods is to make this uh, some infinite 
with Fourier coefficients decaying, but we just do not know whether exponential decay is enough or whether, I mean, we, we would need super exponential decay. Mm -hmm. So this is feasible, but pure absolutely con absolute continuity is tough. And the frequencies that you throw away is usual with Bourguin's lemma. It's not an arithmetic condition. It is just... Okay, so first we um, actually throw away uh, some frequencies. So our first uh, requirement is that frequencies should satisfy something that we call strong diaphantine condition that I had here on my, I just didn't have time to, uh, to uh, talk about them. So this strong Diophantine condition is something that uh, seems uh, has not been known b before. So it's it's conditions that we formulated uh, apparently uh, for the first time. This condition is generic, and properly speaking, it means that we uh, when we consider um, vectors, so our basic frequencies with integer coefficients. So usual Diophantine condition says that. We cannot, uh, I, I mean, we cannot approximate zero very well. So the lengths of uh, linear combinations cannot be very small. But we also want to request that the angles between two such linear combinations mm -hmm. also cannot be very small. Right? And for example, angles between a plane generated by two such vectors and the third vector mm -hmm. also cannot be very small. So this is all assumptions we need, and this is our first thing that we uh, will throw away some frequencies, and then we keep throwing away frequencies using Bourguin's lemma. Yeah, that's a very interesting condition. Do you happen to have uh, counterexamples if this condition is violated? Uh, well, uh, we uh, have examples of, let's say, uh, frequencies that satisfy uh, usual Diophantine condition, but not strong Diophantine condition. No, no, I mean, that I understand. Do yeah. you have an exa example when this uh, property is violated and you don't have uh, this is a or something? Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but uh, that's probably even more difficult than true purity of... Uh, well, actually, in business of... Uh, but as some of it, uh, can, I, I, I guess opening gaps turns out to be more difficult pr process than uh, proving that there are no gaps, especially for high energies. Well, b because effectively to prove, I mean, that um, some point is in a spectrum, you just need to construct one solution right, that with this point as, as, uh, as an eigenvalue, right? And to prove that something is in a gap, you have to prove that any solution you look at, I mean, cannot have energy in this gap, and this is much more difficult. Yeah. Okay, very nice. Let's thank Leonid again. And let me just uh, recall that the thematic session continues tomorrow at uh, 6 p.m. with uh, contributed talks. Hey, everyone there.